questions. So people who are outside, please request you to come. I think we have, uh, I'm just looking for our panelists. I can see Achal, is Amit, and I think Dilip, yeah, Amit is there. Yeah, Dilip is coming in. Dipesh is here, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just waiting for Dilip to come in. Okay. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sujeev Shakya. I'm the chair of Nepal Economic Forum, NEF, a private sector-led thought center. So many of you have attended this NEF talk. And NEF talk is one of our signature programs of the Nepal Economic Forum that we say is built on three Cs. We contextualize, we converse, and we conclude. And the features include about a 75, 90-minute program. We have democratic free seating, no formality of spending hours on addressing people, no privileges, alphabetical order, and no conducting outdated ritual. It's just conversation style. So this, is, this event today is part of the work we are doing with the World Bank uh, on hosting these digital South Aries. Uh, many of you would have attended some of the closed-door sessions. And it's anchored by the Center for Digital Transformation at the Nepal Economic Forum. Our technical lead, Ashray Dixit, currently is in Paris. He's not here. So we have Sugam, who is uh, uh, anchoring this uh, for the Center for Digital Transformation. So we believe that the goal is to start some meaningful conversations, sustained conversations, and to basically improve the foundational elements for Nepal's expanding digital economy. And we want to address challenges. We want to look at, take a multidisciplinary approach, and we want to include the civil society, the private sector, and the academia. So it's a diverse uh, set of people coming together on a dialogue platform, and these conversations are put together, and this is a year-long uh, events we are having, and hopefully this will help in building up the policy dialogues and help the policymakers. So with that, I just want to share with you what will be the running order. So the running order here is that uh, we'll be, there'll be a panel, and we have a great panel. I'll introduce you to them. So we would be in panel discussions for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we would have an opportunity to have interaction from the floor for about 25 minutes, and 4 o'clock we have uh, closing remarks by Meen Prasad Aryal, Director, Standardization Division, Nepal Telecommunication Authority. So with that, may I invite our panelists today in alphabetical order, Anjal Kumar, Managing Director, Daraz Nepal. Their profiles were up there, so you could see, see. yeah, please. Uh, Amit Agrawal, co-founder and director of Khalti. Dilip Agrawal, founder, chairman, managing director of Worldlink Communication, and Dipesh Bishta, CEO of Nepal E-Governance Commission. So when we were curating the session, we said that when we are talking about uh, digitization, digitalization, digital transformation, we need to also look at inclusion. Uh, there's a lot of discourse around the digital divide, and to say that there is a digital divide, there are people who don't have access, inclusion is an issue, people are excluded, therefore certain people have more, uh, more access uh, more capacity to do things, and especially when it could be uh, you're excluded because of your economic status, you could be excluded because of your, uh, the geography you live in, or you may not have access like you could have in the cities. So these were some of the issues that were coming in. So this, today we have put together a, a diverse panel uh, working in this space, but also we want to take their perspective. So we have Anchal Kaur, who is the e-commerce platform, 
and she will talk more about it. So we, then we have Amit talking about you know, the finance platform. We are talking about you know, uh, people being able to scan, people being use, able to use smartphones and devices to just send money, receive money, so how that is working. Then we have Dilip Agrawal, who is a veteran uh, working on the, uh, the ISP company, also an investor in many of these companies. And then we have the government pushing through all, all this. And, uh, and that's, we are very happy to have Dipesh Bishta here, who is the CEO of the Nepal E-Governance Commission, which is trying to, again, uh, make digital government digital services accessible. So we are here talking about uh, digital services and how does it reach the bottom of the pyramid. So the format would be, I would, uh, there would be around three rounds, hopefully, of uh, three minutes interventions that you all can make, at least then that would mean, I'm an accountant by background, so I'm just looking at, you know, <laughs> for 36 minutes of that, and then we would open uh, it to the floor, take some interventions, and then we'll have the closing remarks. So with that, uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Anchal to talk about how the journey of Daraz has been, and how do you see the journey going ahead, just as an introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, be able to share uh, anything about Daraz here with uh, all of you smart people. Um, yeah, so Daraz has been here since 2016. Our vision is uh, to uplift communities through the power of commerce, and that's what we stand by. Um, over the course of the last four years, we've uh, continued to, uh, you know, reach as as uh, many cities as possible. So we've gone from 27 cities, for example, to 101 cities today in Nepal. Um, we have uh, 15,000 sellers currently selling uh, over 1.5 million products um, at Daraz. So I think that is the scale uh, that we've grown in. I think um, I, I know we talk about pandemic <laughs> uh, a lot when we when we talk about e-commerce. So I think it's it's hard for me to avoid that. But I think uh, the pandemic did give us a push in terms of. Uh, more customers being onboarded uh, on the RAS, uh, but it's, you know, as uh, Sujeev Ji asked, like, what's our goal? Is uh, Our goal is to continue focusing more on customer experience, um, and that comes with things like product quality, ensuring that uh, whatever is shown on our platform is actually delivered. I know that that's uh, been a pain point in the past and we continue to work on things like that. Uh, we're a true uh, platform where the sellers and customers are connected, so we don't regulate or mark our prices ourselves, uh, but at the same time we do have the responsibility to ensure that the customers are not cheated. So, so those are things that we uh, continue continue to focus on in addition to things like sustainability, which is core to um, our responsibility, we feel. Uh, so we have invested in things like EV scooters. Uh, we also actually collect all of the packages after deliveries. Uh, customers can either drop it off in our hubs or our offices as well as of today. So um, yeah, continuing to build on that and expanding uh, the customer experience. Thanks, 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 Anjil. So we'll move on to Amit. So you want to talk a bit about Khalti, the past, and what you're looking at, you know, sustaining. Thank you, uh, Suzuki. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone here. Uh, Khalti uh, is a new wallet. Uh, it's been just six years, and uh, it's a licensed payment service provider and a domestic remittance provider from Rashtra Bank. We saw a very good response from the market. It, it had been kind of monopoly market, and now we are able to convert it into a duopoly market at least. In past six years, we were one of the fastest wallets to have three million users. Uh, out of them, like half a million users are uh, transacting every month with us. And like, if you see the impact, if we're even saving five to 10 hours per user per month, we would be saving like five million productive hours for the nation. And we roughly do three billion to four billion rupees uh, transactions per month. And, um, you know, uh, there is a challenge with the ecosystem. You can't just build a wallet and then you know it starts working. You have to integrate to the banks. You have to integrate to the merchants. And in Nepal, there is no unified payment system like in India. So every new wallet has to go and integrate with each and every bank individually. And integrating with each bank would take like six months and more. And if the bank is in a merger process, then you know uh, 
they are not going to integrate for, for a year or so. So that was the biggest challenge when we advertised people would download Kalti and say that, hey, my bank is not there and then they would go to other wallet. So uh, we had to stay there during all these odd times and build on it, give consistent effort and today uh, I think we are, for example, we are number one in all kind of booking. So we are doing very good in movie booking or events ticketing or flight booking. So that's just a baby step. And then yes, obviously the future is financial services. Uh, a lot has happened in financial services, which I will like say in, in, in next questions maybe. So uh, overall a very good response and a very uh, progressive market, very hopeful uh, with, with what is the future of uh, digital banking and financial services in Nepal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. I want to go to Dilip. You want to talk a bit about your, yeah, you can use an independent mic, yeah. Might be easy, yeah. To talk about your <laughs> Worldlink journey and how do you see yourself in the next four or five years? You know, what are the key drivers? Thank you, Sujib. Um, th thank you for having me here today. Uh, you have a good audience, you know. Thank you for being here. Uh, so I don't need to talk about Worldlink. I think most people know about it already, so no point discussing that. But I think what, what I would like to talk about is what we want to do in the future. So um, we have seen the, the traction that broadband has received in Nepal. And uh, Nepal is a very unique example globally of a country where data consumption is not driven by mobile service providers and, by, and through mobile networks, but through fiber. So. Uh, to just to give you an, an example of, uh, of, of how this plays in Nepal, uh, NTC and NCEL combined serve not even one third of the country's data requirements. Okay? Uh, two thirds is served by private ISPs, including Worldlink. And Worldlink is around half of that. So uh, this situation came about in Nepal because this, the, the private mobile operator and the government owned focused heavily on voice and the revenues that voice brings. Unfortunately, those revenues are declining and uh, the, the private ISPs built these nice networks and gave really low cost, high speed and unlimited data that has hooked the consumer on and people are not willing to subscribe to any wireless plan that requires them to be limited by the amount of data they can consume. So because of that mentality, that the data revenues of these mobile operators is not picking up the way it should, but the voice revenues are depleting. So for us, that presents a huge opportunity because the consumer's mindset is, I want fiber in my home, I want unlimited data, and I want it to be fast. Okay? So we are now going on a spree in our company to double our network in the coming three years and try to, uh, today we cover around 30, 32% of the households of Nepal, we're planning to double that to bring it to 70% of all households in Nepal. And that means a massive push in the rural parts of the country. Uh, the, the rural parts of the country, there's a huge demand for data. Uh, we, have a, we have a very thriving network in Karnali, and uh, I've been there three times now, and I've seen the, the, the consumption and the demand there as well. So our push is to go into those areas, the return on investment there is very, very long, but we are very lucky to be backed by very credible international investors that don't, that have the appetite for this kind of investment. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Dilip. So I go to Dipesh. So you want to talk a bit about the e-governance commission, what does it does, and I know it might be good for people to know about it. Good afternoon, everybody. This uh, organization is formed just seven months ago, and the chair of this organization is Right Honorable Prime Minister himself. The co-chair of this organization is Minister for MOCIT. Chief Secretary is member of this commission, and other secretaries are member of this commission, and I'm also one of the member of the commission. So why this commission is formed, this is a big question. I can see a uh, respected Manohar sir here. He was the last uh, vice president of higher level commission for IT, SLCIT. And the, the then government has, uh, has uh, uh, they, they do not feel the requirement of the SLCIT and they have dissolved it. 
but in between the, these 10 years, we found many gap in coordinating all the sectors. Now IT is not the matter of only one sector. It is the cross-cutting issue. What we are doing is that we are thinking e-governance as a translation. E-governance is not translation, it is transformation. We, 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 would, we had the traditional process of giving license to people, we had the traditional process for filling the forms of public service commission. We had translated that traditional system into the softwares. But we have not done the transformation. So e-governance commission is formed for the transformation. There is the, I'm saying it in many programs, there is the difference between digital change and digital transformation. We should not be limited to the digital change. For digital transformation, we are talking about the digital services. How that digital services will be delivered to the people is the main issue of, should, should be the main issue of the government. And we have made a clear vision on that. We have prioritized this in uh, five priorities. Number one priority is we should include only one's policy in the coming IT bill. That means we will, we will be going to collect the data of the people for only one time, not more than that. And that is already practiced in the successful, successfully implemented country like uh, e-governance implement, implemented country like Estonia. Second, we will build e-governance blueprint. Why this e-governance blueprint is required? Because in Nepal, till now, there is the, the latest policy is Digital Nepal Framework, and it was made on 2019. After that, there is not such policy which will integrate all the services. Now, so let's imagine a birth of a child. After the birth of the child, the blood group of the child should be recorded in the national health record system. The vaccination should be should uh, the vaccination details of that child should be recorded in the national health record system. But unfortunately, national health record system is not made till now. So it means that why e-governance blueprint is required is that we want to map all the components that is required in the whole ecosystem where the government should serve the people. So this is number two priority. I'll talk about all the three priorities in my another session because yeah. I should yeah, not sure. cross three minutes. Sure. Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I think uh, we are very happy uh, to have the Pesh here uh, in the sense that, you know, we. Uh, also, people need to know what uh, the government is doing. And we have also seen, having been working in Rwanda, uh, especially a country where we've seen that how in the entire government, you know, um, services are, and payments are delivered through one platform, Irembo. And we've seen that, how it works. We have experienced it over the past couple of years. And so it's great to have you. And also, I think the, 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 the other thing I do want to mention is that the Digital South IRI series and the NEF talks we're having through for the Center for Digital Transformation is what we are discussing for the digital, the new Digital Nepal uh, framework that will be revised from 2019 and uh, hopefully have input for the IT bills, hopefully have uh, in, provide input for many of the policy transformations that we are looking at. So with that, I'll go to uh, Anchal again with this round two. In terms of, uh, so, you know, you are seen as, okay, uh, as a very uh, urban centric, uh, uh, urban-centric organization working in the urban, this is what you're seen as. So what are your plans uh, for taking it, connecting rural Nepal, you know, and because it's all about perception, you know, it's, it could be that people are ordering from around the uh, on Nepal, but you're seen as an urban-centric. So what are your plans for rural Nepal and how do you see that rolling out? Uh, thank you for that question because this is a very uh, big misconception. So uh, as of today, we actually get 40% of our orders outside of Kathmandu Valley. I'll let that number sink in. <laughs> uh, 
so I so I think yes, we're probably seen as urban centric. Maybe it has to do with you know where our office is located, or you know the TikTok videos that you you'll see on on the Raz that's uh, coming mostly from uh, our offices or our influencers. But we do have a big reach, uh, and I do think this is actually a big potential for our company as well as uh, as well as for the customers because. Uh, in Kathmandu, actually, people have a lot of different options uh, in terms of shopping. Um, out of Valley, things do get very limited. Um, so I think there is a huge potential for us to continue expanding. As I said earlier, we do serve uh, 101 cities, um, and that's uh, with a combination of our own logistics uh, services as well as our third-party uh, partners. Uh, in addition to that, we also have partnerships with organizations like FNCCI, CNI, UNICEF, uh, where we're working with a lot of sellers even outside of uh, Valley as well. So last year of the total number of sellers that we onboarded, about 35% were uh, from out of Valley as well. So we do focus on things like that. Uh, we do focus on building um, our content on Doraz University that is available for everyone uh, to access and learn how to establish businesses in, um, in Doraz. Uh, I think we provide a, a, a unique opportunity in that um, the, the investment is a lot lower uh, when you start a shop at, uh, at an e-commerce site versus if you have to open a physical store with um, all of the rent and everything included and have to do your own marketing. So I think there's, there's a lot of leverage there that um, the small medium businesses have been uh, seeing. Uh, we're also doing things like, uh, so recently we partnered with NMB Bank, um, and, and they're offering uh, uh, no collateral loans for our, our sellers, up to, I believe it's five lakhs. Um, and that's a unique opportunity that I think we can provide because we can look at uh, the seller's performance over a course of a year and, and kind of like, you know, their, their ratings and things like that and assume that, you know, with, with this much of experience, we're able to take that risk. So I think all of those things are actually helping with the small, medium businesses um, in Kathmandu and outside. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anshul. I think it's fascinating to know that you have 40% of your, you know, sort of your sales happening outside Kathmandu Valley and 35% uh, of your uh, vendors. This reminds me, uh, once uh, the Kimberly Clark CEO, Prakash Ayer, he had visited Nepal and he was telling me the similar stories when they started selling Huggies diapers online. 85% of their sales were happening you know, in, in very st small town villages and figuring out the logistics of delivering them, you know, because you are selling at a certain price and then you're realizing that the orders were coming from very remote places where the transportation costs, the cost for delivery, you know, the last mile delivery was very high. So I think it's, it's great stories uh, to hear. So Amit, I will move to, you know, from e-commerce to digital financial inclusion and to say that what do you think has helped to accelerate digital financial inclusion in the past couple of years? And what do you think has not and where we need to look at? Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, I think uh, for us, uh, I'll start with the payments first and then move on to digital financial services. The biggest thing was uh, our regulator being very progressive. You know, uh, you'll not hear a lot of people telling that, but we feel that our regulator is very progressive. The first step was, NRB establishing a separate department, payment service department in itself was a recognition for the industry. And the department has been very progressive and now they have also established national payments board, which has members from NRB, from NTA and uh, ministries, you know. So they are working very progressively. Uh, some of the policies that they came up with uh, has helped us. Uh, the first thing was, uh, Initially, when wallets started, the limits were like 5,000 rupees, but now they, then they made it 25,000, and then they made it 50,000, and now they have made it 2 lakh rupees, you know, so that's been like quite positive. Uh, second, uh, they have allowed 10% VAT refund on online payments, and, you know, uh, that's a big 
uh, it's a mindset, you know, like the government living on taxes, like that's uh, rare, right? Even for worldling payments, uh, monthly we get a tax rebate of 30, 40 lakh rupees, just wow. tax rebate uh, for online wow. payments. You know, if you pay through Khalti, you get a VAT refund, a 10% VAT refund. So that's been another good policy. The third policy was like when on online payments, we used to give cashbacks and all cashbacks are subject to 15% TDS. And the policy says that now the, there's no TDS on cashback. So that has been another good policy. The fourth policy is now <clears throat> they're working on digital lending uh, guidelines and they have allowed PSPs, uh, it's already out in fact, they've allowed PSPs to do uh, lending in collaboration with banks. So the ledger has to be in bank initially. So we can do unsecured lending of up to 500,000, like five lakh rupees for salaried bank accounts. And even for non-salaried, we can do two lakh rupees, you know. And uh, we are already working, we are already uh, working with some banks to launch some products. So financial services, uh, uh, like it's just started. And on good note, uh, I think NRB is already working on DZ bank licenses, you know. So the idea is to have banks without branches and all. So initially they will not give it to PSPs, they'll be giving it to some banks. <coughs> but we fintechs, we collaborate with banks to be their digital arm and like build things on that. Uh, so uh, I, th I see a very bright future there as well. On the other hand, if you see the uh, national insurance, uh, now it's Pratikaran. So it was Bhima Samiti earlier, it's, uh, it's Pratikaran now. So they have opened up corporate agency licenses and PSPs can become uh, corporate agency. So we have started uh, Khalti Suraksha and you know we are already working with HEI and providing insurance services in the market. Khalti Suraksha is already out. Uh, so these are some of the policies and there has been more progressive policies in the monetary policy. So I think in coming days uh, the way the regulator is working, uh, I know there are some flags like a lot of people ask me why we are not allowed to send dollars outside Nepal or why Bitcoin is not legal in Nepal? You know, that's a separate topic. You know, to to be, to allow us to send dollars outside Nepal, our forex deficit has to be taken care of, and for that we need to, you know, build entrepreneurs here. We uh, all our lending today is collateral based. You know, so there's not impact lending, and that will come gradually with with such services. Now, going forward, what is going to work for us? What we need most from the government? Uh, I think the C also rightly said, uh, having only one ID. So if you see the transformation in India, if you see the India stack, the base of the India stack was Aadhaar card. Uh, yeah. And after Aadhaar, they built the UPI, and now they are, being, they are working on Bharat OS, they are, being, they are working on a lot of things. So for us also, NID is going to be very, very crucial. And it is also going in fast pace, like 40% people have already received their NID. But we request that NID has to be like, currently it is mandatory for passport renewals, but then if it becomes mandatory for bank accounts, for everything, then uh, you know, we can replace uh, citizenship. And if uh, there can be proper systems, proper API communication that if you just put the uh, NID and you get all the, uh, you don't have to do KYC again and again, I think this is one thing Nepal should do really fast. Why it is required for payments like us? Because it helps us uh, lease our, like, uh, make our KYC process easy. It prevents a lot of fraud. And with digitization, we can serve a lot of services. Till today, only 7% payments has been digitized. 93% payments are not digitized. The most used service is recharge card. Surprisingly, like, I would not quote the telco, Till date, like if you talk about today, 60% uh, recharge is still happening through physical recharge card. So we come from an era where like, you know, if, if you have to do a recharge card of 100 rupees, my friend would first do 10 rupees recharge and say it works and then they would do 100, you know. Or if they book a flight ticket, they would call me that, hey, I booked a ticket. Uh, did I actually get a seat or not, you know. So that awareness, literacy, trust, it took us a lot of time. But with NID, I think uh, we can fast track that. There's a lot more to it if time permits. Uh, uh, one more thing that is very important for us and that played a crucial role also was a government making it mandatory to have IRD verified billing for transactions above 10 crore per year. So when the ecosystem gets digitized, then digital payments you know, will, will, will be there. So now I think the government is thinking to reduce it to seven crores and then five crores. And you see a lot of now online billing systems coming, you know because there's going to be a lot of scope there. So if, if merchants have, uh, if they come to formal economy, if they start a proper billing system, I think uh, online payments will grow really fast in Nepal and there's a big scope.
for that. Thank you. No, thank you, Amit. I think, uh, yeah, we also very much agree on, on financial inclusion, the way the regulators have been pretty proactive. Actually, tomorrow we are launching the Nepal Financial Inclusion Report. So BEAD management has been, we've been working with UN Capital Development Fund uh, since 2015. So tomorrow we have the report launched. So we, it was from, so we see some transformational changes, but of course, as I said, lots of areas to work on. But definitely if we compare to some of the other countries in the region, we've been able to push a lot of things. No, thank you for that. So Dilip, coming to again, you, you started off talking about broadband access in remote parts, and, and I think there's a conversation I had with one of your colleagues on, you know, when I was in Surkhet, and uh, the penetration there in 10 years, the sort of the numbers that have grown, you know, multifold. So where do you see, you know, sort of what would be the, some of the area, things that you need to do to accelerate this, you know, sort of, uh, one is as a private sector firm, you can do things, but what do you require within the ecosystem for this to accelerate? So I don't want to put the numbers uh, on the access part of it uh, that we are talking about, but yeah, to, to uh, make the access you know, inch deeper, I would say, in terms of numbers, percentages. Yeah, so um, you know, <clears throat> it's very unfortunate that in Nepal, uh, broadband is taxed the way liquor or cigarettes are taxed. You know, so we have a direct taxation of over 30%. You know, um, on, on broadband, it's around maybe 32% exact numbers. I cannot recall. And then on top of that, uh, the income tax is 30%, which is uh, what, uh, let's say, the banks are, are taxed. Even industries are, are at a 25% income tax rate. Uh, so I don't know why the, the government feels that, uh, maybe because of NCEL and NTC, they feel that we are a very heavily uh, profit-earning industry. You know, our PAT isn't that pretty, you know, unfortunately, because we have huge investments and huge depreciation expenses. You know, but still the government feels that we should be taxed heavily. Consumers should pay a premium if they want to use broadband uh, because you know, those direct taxes get directly paid by the consumer. And we have tried to, uh, tried to lobby the government to, to reduce or remove these taxes, which some of them have been added only three or four years ago. You know, wh what is the point of adding these taxes in an era where we are talking about digital inclusion, we are talking about e-governance, and we're talking about expanding reach uh, of the internet and, and delivering e-commerce or, or e-governance services. But uh, so far, this has all fallen on deaf ears. Maybe the current government will listen to them and try to reduce the taxes. So I think that's a huge component of the, the, the costs sense. that make broadband I, a little more expensive and less affordable when we go into these rural areas. For urban markets, it is, it is okay because uh, currently the ARPU, the average revenue per user that the industry experiences is around 900 rupees, which is quite affordable for an urban household. But if you go to the rural household, they are looking for something more in the range of 500 to 600 rupees. And that is something we cannot deliver until the government say, steps in and says, okay, we will not take these taxes, at least if you go into these rural areas. You know? So that's, I think, a big concern for us. Uh, besides that, uh, there, is, there are perennial issues that we face in terms of uh, uh, lack of clarity regarding stringing fiber on the poles in Nepal. You know? uh, in rural areas, it's less of a concern because nobody cares. You, know, you go put something up and uh, and if it works, everybody's happy. But in urban areas and, and urbanizing areas, that's becoming a huge concern. And we, we were hoping that the government would bring some clarity on that, uh, maybe bring some regulations around deploying uh, you know, overhead fiber in urban areas that you can see uh, has created quite a big mess in, in most uh, dense urban areas of Nepal. Uh, this is something that causes a lot of duplicate investment uh, by service providers and ultimately it's the people, the consumer who pays for all that. You know, somebody has to foot the bill uh, and uh, <clears throat> it's, it's unproductive, it's counterproductive in fact. So I think these are the two issues that I think about the most. Um, for us as a company, uh, when, we, when we think of expanding massively the way I mentioned uh, uh, previously, uh, it's all about people and, and how do we uh, onboard, how do we train and groom people to be able to go into these areas, build
build the network and, and do business, you know, because uh, it's, it's a different model altogether from operating in an urban environment where it's easier to find people and people are willing to stay in the urban areas and work there. Thank, thanks, Dilip. Uh, I think two very pertinent points and I'll come back to you to see that what could be some of the uh, role that uh, multilaterals like World Bank and other institutions can play. So I'll come back to you on that so you can start thinking. So I'll go to the patient to see that uh, so what, what are your plans for the next three years? You know, so you've just been formed in, uh, uh, seven months ago. It's, it's, a, it's a body that's integrating a lot of the roles around the government. Uh, so what are your priorities? What are your focus areas? So if we could just uh, learn about that. I have already explained two of it. Yeah, so I'll more. add uh, uh, other, other three, three priorities. First, I said only one's policy in the act. Second, I said about making the e-governance blueprint that will integrate all the services. That will be the master document, master red roadmap for Nepal. Third, we'll start the integration on the basis of the e-governance blueprint. And fourth, after the integration, the people will be getting the services from the integrated platform. Our, our motto will be one ID, one platform. I mean, we talk about digital divide, we talk about digital literacy, we talk about uh, that people are not getting the services equally. So how that can be made possible? So we are thinking of making the one-stop solution in Nepal. You can, if you can take the common minimum program of the government, in common minimum program of the government, we have already included that the government will stop one-stop solution. So what is that? That is like the model in Georgia. That is like the model in India itself. Because in India, there are more than 495,000 common service centers. These common service centers are operated by the private sector. The government give license, gives license to the private sector and they operate. So, we are also going to establish such one-stop solution. So what we, it will do, it will give accessibility to the services to the, uh, that is given by the government. And fifth, the most important thing, where World Bank is also involved. Without the effective implementation of Digital Nepal framework, all these things will not be going to be possible. Because we are talking about e hard Bazaar in 80 initiatives of Digital Nepal framework, but till now we have not made e hard Bazaar. We, we talk about different other initiatives, we are, we're, we are not implementing these things. So, I'm inside the system of the government for the last two years, and what I realize is that this e-governance making the transformation, sorry to use the term, but it is like the war. It is not less, uh, less, uh, it is not less than, uh, less effective, I mean, we, we, know it, we need that much effort as to win the war. So transformation is like that. So for that war, what we require is that we require the troops of e-governance, we require the tra digital transformation troops in all stakeholders. In bureaucracy, we, we require such troops. We will advocate, we'll do advocacy about the e-governance. We'll require that in the member of parliaments. We'll, we'll require that digital just transformation troops within the politicians. And most importantly, we require such soldiers, such troops, who talk about digital transformation like you people, who are working in the private sector, who are working in the civil society, who are working as the journalist. So all, if all on are onboarded on the, same, uh, on, the, on the same page, then only transformation is possible. The biggest challenge of digital transformation is the existing forces are resistive to the change. So if we are able to make them understand about why this is required, then this is possible. So what we have done, we have kept one program in our budget of this year. We are going to take, uh, we are go going to give trainings to the member of parliaments. We are going to give the trainings to the officials who are in the decision making positions. First of all, they should understand about why this transformation is required. So, in, I think in coming three years, we'll be able to succeed uh, to this level. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, this is very encouraging to hear, and coming from somebody in, in the government, I think it's, it's a, we have all the hardware, but it's the mindware that needs to be, you know, sort of transformed. The software is there, the hardware is there. So I'll go back to, Achal, you know, sort of changing gears a bit uh, in terms of, um, as one of the things we see also as you want to, you know, sort of as a company, you can only do so much because you are not the government, you know, you are, you are a private sector company, we need to look at, you know, we also are in a private sector business. So, so in terms of proliferating um, good services into rural areas, one of the challenges is the logistics, the last mile logistics. So what could be one or two things that institutions like World Bank, multilaterals, development partners, along with the government, can do to help uh, in that regard? Um, so I think when it comes to logistics, um, I, I think in Nepal, uh, there's just a lot of uh, different needs when it comes to rural areas versus Kathmandu. So earlier I had mentioned that we have our own logistics services uh, as well as we use uh, other third party partners. Um, for our own logistics, actually we are uh, one of the fastest and uh, the most uh, cost efficient. Um, however, we just cannot expand to every single corner in Nepal based on the volumes that we currently have because we do have to rely more on uh, economies of scale as well. Um, so, so in order to do that, I think just, you know, um, the, the basics and the framework uh, of uh, the logistic uh, partners um, are also not as strong um, as it's needed, especially uh, as, as you go into like rural, really rural areas. I think it's no surprise that even um, our, our landscape is challenging, but at the same time, I think our, our roads could be better, our modes of transportation could be safer. Uh, I think uh, of late, we're also scared to even fly on planes to uh, one of the major cities in, in Nepal altogether. So I I think if we uh, could really focus on building more the transportation uh, systems that are more efficient and um, safer, I think that would be of tremendous tremendous help. Um, but as as ourselves, we're already working with some of the government bodies. So for example, we're actually, uh, we started partnering with a Nepal Post Office as of last year. Uh, we were using their offices as one of the drop-off points for our customers as well. So um, definitely things are in motion, but uh, still a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Anjil. So coming to Amit. No, similar sort of a question uh, to proliferate. So there's, we talked about trust people not, you know, figuring out that, you know, is this, like, that happens to me. Like, I, I do, at times I say, okay, I'm not going to carry my wallet, but then I'm just making a payment and it doesn't work. You know, there's some internet problem or there's some problem. So, so what are some of the, is it the, around awareness? Is it around offtake? Because one thing in Nepal we see is that People are, you know, especially because our population is like that, you know, 70% are under 40, you know, 50% are under 25, the adaptability is faster, I would say. So what are some of the, is it the focus has to be in awareness, has to be on, like for what Anchal is talking about, is on actually building infrastructure, uh, helping in building infrastructure. So what could be one or two priority areas that multilaterals, bilaterals, and also the government can look at? especially to proliferate the services towards, you know, towards uh, gaining inclusion. Thank you, Sujibji, for this question. So I'll answer it from two perspectives. So for consumers, yes, uh, there are three pillars, access, trust, and literacy. So we have to work on all three. And uh, it's also the ecosystem, like I said earlier. Uh, so for example, uh, when we launched Khalte, uh, uh, to do mobile recharges, you know, we would buy the recharge, we would scratch it, we would enter that manually in Excel sheets and like, you know, put it online and then when people would buy it and get it, you know, but the end user was not do, would not know that. And then we had challenges where we, we made a system, we did like, if, if there's a transaction failure, it should be auto-refund. Fine. But what happens is like, we did auto-refund and then later the provider says that, no, it was success and your money is like, we have to keep prepared balances there and it was deducted. So as a wallet, I had to disable auto-refund. And there had been, like, till today, if you say Nepal Electricity Authority, uh, 
the amount, if you see amount wise, uh, we collect the largest amount for any. But uh, it's, it's an online payment, but it doesn't work before 10 a.m. Or there are cases where the consumer will have the bill in his or her hand, but the data is not available online because the person who goes uh, to do the meter reading has to come back and sync the data and then it goes online. So what I'm trying to tell that, you know, <clears throat> the merchants are not investing on their IT, you know. Uh, there has been cases where uh, if there is a transaction problem on, on I'll say, on a Friday evening or Saturday, and you know it's very difficult to get support even from a bank at times, and it's just consumer's money. Like a con consumer has booked a movie ticket on Saturday, you know, it, the consumer needs it, it's it's very time sensitive thing, right? But uh, wallet alone can't solve it. So uh, this has been a challenge, but. Gradually, you know, now people are investing on their IT, you know, they are investing on their systems. They are at least keeping a support person. For example, Khalti has a call center which works from like say early in the morning, 6 a.m. to 12 a.m. in the midnight. But uh, we solve, like we make a better turnaround times for the things which are under our control, but for which we have to depend on third parties we can't serve. So we are coming through these services. Then a lot of government payments, you know. Digitization has been done, but it's not fully automated. You know? But it's still a one step ahead. So for example, vehicle registration system. So you can now pay taxes for your vehicle, VRS, uh, online in Bagmati, like not in other places. So we launched it and we like advertise it and then we come to know that even if you pay the tax online, you have to visit the Yata to get your blue book stamped. And if it is not stamped, you know, you you can't, uh, r run your vehicle on the road. So, though it is not our work, but we have now come up with a blue book service where we go to your house, we pick your blue book for your car or bike, we go to the Yatayat, get it stamped, pay your taxes online, pay your insurance online, and then we drop it back to you. So, you know, you have to work that extra mile uh, to bring that trust and, uh, you know, other such things. So, there are many such services which the ecosystem is now working on. And yes, literacy and trust is very important because see our fight is with cash. And cash has that touch and feel, you know, and it's a lifestyle. So for, if you say for my dad, uh, to pay electricity bill is a lifestyle. He would go out and then it would, you know, it would take his time, he would stand in the queue, pay the bill, get that hard receipt, you know, which gives him some relief and come back, while coming back he would buy some veggies and come back home and file it. <laughs> you can't replace that with an online payment, right? So, it's a big behavioral change, uh, but yes, we have empowered a lot of people also. We launched the Smart Chori campaign, you know, and it, it's been very successful. <clears throat> Even small thing, like a lot of girls in our, uh, in our uh, cohort would say that it was very difficult for us to go out at 9 p.m. and get our mobiles recharged, and we used to tell our brothers, and, like, and then he would ask, why, you, why, why do you need a recharge? Why do why you want to do so much recharge and all? So, you know, there are a lot of things which are happening positively. Now coming back to the government and merchant side, you know, if you see nearby markets uh, in China, Alipay, WeChat is doing great. In India, there is uh, like Paytm was a boom during demonetization, but now there's GPA, Amazon Pay and whatnot. But they have been fueled by, by a lot of investment and, uh, you know, backup. For Nepal, <coughs> the appetite is not there uh, to, to get money from local investors. It's thanks to Worldlink who believed in us. It's a good story, a local investor investing on a local startup and like coming to this level. But then to have that scale, we need foreign investors. And the biggest concern for all foreign investors is the exit. They first want to have a guarantee exit and the good exit policy. If they say that you have to take 10 approvals to get an exit, you know, they, they are reluctant for it. Right? So that is one problem. On the other hand, uh, why would merchants go online? What is the benefit from the government? So if you see in India, the, uh, the government said that they would bear the MDR, the merchant service fee, if you take an online payment. And, but here, like, there's no credit rating or uh, if I go online, uh, I don't get any special loan or any incentive. So uh, why would a Kirana Pasal who's doing everything offline go online? Why? What is the reason? They'll not go. Or why would a taxi give you, start giving you bills? And if they don't give you uh, an a, a invoice, uh, why would they want to go digital? Because as soon as they go digital, you know, they come under the tax brackets. So this informal economy is a big challenge. And for the transition, you know, there has to be a plan, there has to be incentives. Even the VAT refund thing. 
for merchants it is not that lucrative because the merchant has to upgrade their billing system upgrade their invoice and every transaction has to hit uh, the real time to the uh, IRD and the customer would get 10% of the VAT as sure. a refund which is like 1.3% not a big amount so uh, no i think i only know about we doing it with worldling because worldling is our investor and we we really pushed it hard and we do it but uh, it was not a big successful program as such so we have to think through all these things and i think thanks. if government works on that yeah it can be good thanks thanks amit no i think uh, lots of things you've brought out uh, points out to some of the larger issues that we need to look at is about facilitating you know exits of investments you know so that's a, that's another piece to discuss but it's good to know how these things are all linked so and linked to that uh, dilip i'll come to you you know you've just been recently invested you know bi has invested in you you have uh, uh, you know, equity funds that are investing in you so what are these you know one or two things that these investors see in nepal as an opportunity because they are investing and in in this and where do they see this the transformation going on and of course there are challenges i think amit talked about the challenges but what are some of the silver linings they see that that has made bii to invest in worldlink has made you know uh, uh, dolma fund to uh, invest in you well, well i <clears throat> i would be putting words in their mouth but i think what they see is the opportunity because nepal is at such a let's say low level in terms of uh, development compared to like, other economies around us that uh, there's a lot of opportunity to invest and make that money grow over time uh, and and besides that uh, most of the investors that we hear about that you mentioned uh, they have a they have another side another side of the investment is they want to see some impact right they want to see that the money that they invest uh, does not get lost brings a brings a return uh, not an aggressive return but has an impact as well has a developmental impact on the country so i think that i think that's very good for us because uh, the way nepal is today uh, we already see it in numbers uh, a private foreign investor would not come here you know and and make a private equity investment it is very very rare for that to happen we don't hear about it but these funds have the appetite they have the uh, the long tenure in terms of having a long time horizon and uh, they're willing to wait it out you know, nepal is progressing it will progress it's just that it's progressing too slow unfortunately you know uh, but it is progressing and it, we will get there now the hope is we get there in a few years and not like in in a decade or two uh, but we are lucky that these investors see this potential and they're willing to wait it out you know and and that's i think the silver lining thanks thanks dilip so i'll come to, uh, before we uh, final uh, you know sort of a speaker before we go to the audience so i mean it was fascinating what you're talking about talking to parliamentarians because we are also the world bank is starting a dialogue series with parliamentarians on different issues uh, we feel that now also we are uh, while people talk about the challenge in nepali politics but we are also seeing a lot of young voices you know one parliamentarian asking very simple questions that are making people want, well, find answers so i think that's a great start uh, so uh, talking to parliamentarians and 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 you i i really appreciate your you know candid remarks to say that where the challenges of change are so one of the things that we see is also coordination and this is not only in uh, nepal but in every country that is undergoing digital transformation i think india is a great example i think aadhaar just happened and that accelerated the pace there but we still see a uh, lot of challenges in india and in other countries in terms of coordination between different ministries different government departments how do you see that panning out is there a sort of a a sort of a desire to bring about the change and move and you know sort of where do you see what one or two priorities apart from you talked about uh, multiple priorities but in this coordination because that's where we see at many times like this blue book example is a classic example of a coordination issue yeah uh i have asked one question to one of the worldwing guys in my informal meeting and the question was how many parliamentarians know about digital nepal framework how many leaders how many politicians know about digital nepal framework and your investment and until and unless i'll i'll sure, ask sure. i'll answer the first question 
until and unless the questions of the transformation is raised in the House of Representatives, the change is not going, the transformation is not going possible. So, first of all, what I suggest to World Bank as well, to the organizer as well, first of all, see, there is the NDAC meeting. NDAC meeting means it, it is the meeting that is headed by the Prime Minister himself. In that meeting, all the ministers will come, all the chief minister will come, all the secretaries will come, and we talk about the national problems in that meeting. In that meeting, we should talk about the digital transformation. We, in that meeting, we should be able to talk about why this digital Nepal framework is not being implemented as it is imagined, one thing. Another is, see, there is the major problem in co coordination. If we talk about digital Nepal framework that where, where World Bank is involved, there are three hierarchies. One, there is high-level steering committee where the, the chair is prime minister himself. Second, the, there is coordination committee. Chief secretary is, chair, is chairing the committee. Second, there is digital Nepal management office. office. In four years, there was no any meeting of the steering committee. In two, four years, there was two meetings of the coordination committee. And in four years, no any office like Digital Nepal Management Office is established. Then how can we implement this Digital Nepal framework as we imagined? Because the structures that we are making is not working properly. So what I was, before this responsibility, I was IT advisor to Prime Minister. So what I reported to in that time to the Prime Minister is that until and unless we establish an organization where the Prime Minister is heading himself, the intervention is not possible. Prime Minister and the Prime Minister office is only the legitimate organization in the system where it can intervene. Only one ministry cannot implement. Only one ministry. It, it's very, very difficult to implement this in the Digital Nepal framework to one ministry. Because when that ministry calls meeting of joint secretaries, then one of the ministry will send the computer operator. And how that computer operator will go back to his ministry and, and, and make the policy? And another problem, see, I was attending another problem which, which I organized by the agriculture ministry and UNCDF. There are 11 initiatives of agriculture ministry. But in that case, even the ministries are not asking for the budget to implement the digital Nepal framework. So, the big question goes to World Bank as well. Sure. Not only the government. Sure. Sir, you are expert worldwide, but your project is not being implemented as is it, it, it is imagined. Why? So, please work on the structure that you have made, but it is not working properly. In that role, e-governance commission can, we, we can play the role for, for the coordinations. And we have kept that mandate. In digital Nepal, implementing digital Nepal framework, we have the role of our coordination. We'll call the meetings between the ministries. We'll call, and luckily, on Sunday, we are going to have our first meeting of the commission, wow. which will be chaired by the Prime Minister himself and where uh, Minister for MOCIT will be the co-chair. And in that meeting as well, we'll talk about the digital Nepal framework implementation. So we'll play a good role in, uh, in, the, in coordinating all these activities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think message is very strongly taken. And uh, we would, um, so there is a high level uh, visit uh, of the World Bank happening in June. And of course, there'll be meetings with the Prime Minister. So we would be definitely pass on this message because I think this is not only with this, because there are other initiatives, as you mentioned, on the agriculture side. There's on the grid agenda, we have the green, resilient, inclusive development. Similar situations we are facing where uh, the policy framework is there, but the implementation agencies have not been formed, has not been working. And, you know, and if we talk to the, uh, the people and the, you know, sort of the senior folks in the government or the politics, they will say that, oh, we have had political uncertainty. We are having, uh, you know, we couldn't be able to move things in the parliament because from Ju June 2019, 
Uh, we have, I yet to see any major legislation that has gone through, and it's going to be nearly four years, uh, comes July 2019, that any major pieces of legislation has passed through in Nepal. So this is a good time to open up the floor. We have about 10 minutes or so. We can take up two or three uh, interventions from the floor. So, you know, please raise your hands, please, you know. So we, have, we call it the ask principle. Always introduce yourself, stick to the topic, keep it short. 30 seconds, 60 seconds, we talk in 60 seconds, not in minutes, so please, there'll be microphones around, so please raise your hand and we'll take a bunch of three or four questions and come back for the final round. So there's a gentleman on the left, can you just pass the microphone to him, please. Please introduce yourself. My name is Prazul Dungana and I'm uh, currently in my final year, uh, Bachelor's in Economics, Kathmandu University School of Arts. So my question is pointed towards Mr. Uh, Dipes, so uh, you, you mentioned about the structure of e-governance commission and also the plans uh, about the one-stop solution. And uh, uh, you, uh, so my question is, uh, you, you mentioned about your end objectives. Would you clarify on the action plan which you will take to get to the one-stop solution and the resources that uh, are available for you to do that as a Thank commission. Yeah. Okay, the gentleman in the front. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, this is me, Bupendra Shrestha. Uh, I head uh, digital sales for Himalayan Everest Insurance. Uh, this is not a question, basically, but I just wanted to put up something that uh, we've been doing in Himalayan Everest Insurance, which could be helpful to the, uh, the government. So uh, I would like to point out to Dipesh Ji on this, maybe, because at present, uh, uh, Himalayan Everest Insurance has a capacity to reach 75% of the total population of Nepal, be it uh, uh, financial inclusion or awareness uh, related with health, uh, say, uh, social security and all that. So we already have that uh, infrastructure. We have a capacity to uh, reach out to not just to the uh, cities but to the urban population as well. And we have already started doing it in a small scale. So in anywhere we can you know, accommodate in your plans, we would be very happy to uh, be a part of it. Since we've been already working with Daraz, we've uh, been working with uh, Kalti, uh, in Kalti Suraksha, and also with uh, someone we in touch in uh, the world, uh, worldling as well. So this is something that uh, we, as a public limited company, Imal and Everest Insurance have done it for the last three years. We've been trying to uh, get uh, the financial inclusions and, and get the services to the uh, audience. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. So can you pass the microphone at the back? There's a gentleman at the back. And, and then I'll... Uh, namaste. Uh, my name is Vivek Kandel. Um, I mean, like, it's lovely to hear about the advances that Nepal has seen in the digital services ecosystem. But when you talk about the base of the pyramid and the discussion about onboarding, uh, you know, like, uh, like reaching out to more and more uh, people. And since I was just reading about the, you know, there's a talk about the digital divide, inclusion. And I've seen that most of our digital services are, requires the internet connectivity. And I'm like, Suji often refers uh, <clears throat> his learning experiences from Rwanda. Actually, you know, like until recently, I was working in the East African countries. And I see that most of their such kind of digital services, I mean, like whatever they do, that does not require uh, the connect, like the internet uh, connectivity. Do you see that such kind of things can, I mean, like when, we, like, like when you talk about the transformation or reaching out to new consumers, how do you see that those sort of things contribute to the digital divide that which we, we are trying to close? So where do you see uh, the sector moving forward? I'm just, just curious about. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So, the gentleman out there. Yeah, Sonam, you can pass. This. It was a wonderful session. Uh, Please introduce yourself. My name is Pasang. So, I am an early stage startup founder. So, my question is a little longer, but please be with me. Uh, no, one of my you will get 30 seconds. Okay, sure, sure. One of my friends was struggling to make a payment last week. So, it's a payment from India to Nepal and Nepal to India. So, uh, in one of the news, by Honorable Prime Minister himself, uh, uh, since uh, Dipesar is working on this uh, project, 
uh, payment gateways like LaserPay, uh, MyPayment, uh, BharatPay, and uh, other gateways are working. Is the possibility working in India and the gateways like Kalti, Eseva, and all working in Nepal? So is this just an optimistic statement by the Honorable Prime Minister, or can we see this happening soon, or soon but when? Thank, Thank you. you. There was a gentleman at the back, and uh, there was a lady out here. Then we'll come back. I think I'm just looking at the time. Just, then we'll close it. Um, hi, uh, my name is Samik Karel. I'm a freelance journalist and researcher as well. Um, my question um, is more of a statement, rather. So um, we are caught between analog and digital. So like, even if I take digital services, I still have to go through dadas and stuff. So how can we clear that, firstly? Um, and uh, one of the initiations that was happening is like smart palikas, which uh, caught my eyes. Um, um, actually, it's a good initiation where you consolidate services and bring it together. But um, if you go to the App Store or Google Store, there's not even like 100 um, downloads. So where did it fail? And why is public service delivery deplorable um, in Nepal, even if I want to seek it um, digitally? Yeah. Thank you. So this is the last intervention from the lady out here. Yeah. Building trust with regards to digital services and also about how like a change in mindset is required. But my question is more along the lines of what do you think is the current um, consumer protection um, situation or consumer uh, protection policies and frameworks with regards to digital services? Because right now, for example, in our office, we have two internet providers because we don't know when one's going to go down. <laughs> I go to a restaurant, I swipe my, or I pay with a QR code, and it gets debited three times. I get refunded 10 days later. I don't get interest on those um, refunded amounts, right? So are, are we as consumers expected to bear the consequences of our own failures as well as failures of other stakeholders in the digital ecosystem? Thank you. Okay, so I think I'm just going to uh, close this and I'm just mindful of the time and do a round. So there are questions that have come, anything that you would want to respond. I know some of them are directed to Dipesh, but any question that you would like to, uh, any, all four of you can just take the final two minutes each and to respond to some of the questions that have come. Uh, I think most questions were not directed to me. <laughs> but something on something on think, something uh, on consumer protection. Uh, yes, what do you that's think? That's the one that I was gonna address. So thank you, Nora. I, I, it's nice to see you again. Um, yeah. So I think uh, when it comes to consumer protection, uh, there has being an uh, an MNC. Uh, we have actually international standards. So it's uh, one of the PCI compliance. Maybe some of you guys know. Um, it, it's it's actually what we follow for uh, consumer protection in terms of data privacy and things like that. And, and I, I think that is the standard that most of our partners follow as well. Um, I personally think that the government does a, a pretty good job uh, when they get customer complaints in calling us and, and addressing that. Uh, our, our team is, is probably in, uh, you know, uh, the, the government offices quite frequently uh, in assuring and, and uh, figuring out like what are the challenges that the customers are facing, what's been brought up in and addressing that. Um, I will, however, also highlight that I don't think this is just a digital issue. Yeah, it's, it's actually a cultural well, issue. Well, cultural issue. Uh, I, I feel like a lot of times in Nepal, we are okay with a lot of things that we shouldn't be okay with. Um, and I think that is what I would want to highlight and, and ask that everyone raise their voices. Um, I'll give you a simple example. We actually just moved our head office to Tapatali and uh, the level of, you know, uh, uh, missing on details that goes into construction is just very painful. So I think that is just another example of, of how we're just okay with a lot of things. Well, it, a door is built. It's just that the handles don't work as they were supposed to, but the door is in, is in working condition. I think that is uh, the level of acceptance that we also have culturally that also needs to change. Thank you. 
Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of questions were related to payments. So I'll try to answer them in my capacity. The first question about digital divide. Uh, so before Kalti, we worked in a SMS service, like it's still there, Sparrow SMS. So we have we have worked in a lot of rural areas offline through SMS. You know, so while we were building Kalti, uh, even in SMS, we thought like after SMS, we should be building apps on USSD and IVR, you know, but when, when we closely saw India and Nepal, in Nepal it was actually a leap uh, from uh, SMS to mobile app and it would not make sense for us initially to then build apps uh, over USSD. Uh, the, if you see the customs data for smartphone import, uh, during then when we launched it was like 25% growth on, on smartphone and currently the penetration is 69 to 70% for smartphones. But what we have done is, uh, you can do your recharge even if you're not connected to internet uh, through an offline SMS which is toll free. So, uh, you know, in the back end the SMS goes and it works. But yes, uh, we have our own challenges, we, we have not catered to featured phones. Uh, that is simply because the ecosystem was not ready. So had the ecosystem been ready and all the payments were working very good, the merchants uh, technology and support was very good, it would make sense for us to work for smartphones and all. But uh, sorry, for featured phones, but we have one battle to fight already. Then we have another battle to go and integrate with banks, you know. There's no UPI stuff like that. So that's why it, was, it would not be wise for us to first build apps for featured phones or the SIM-based apps. So we stick to the, uh, uh, the, play to, uh, the smartphone apps. But yes, it works offline. Uh, you can do some of the services offline. So that is my answer to you. The next question uh, about the cross-border payments. So again, our regulator has been progressive. Uh, initially, you know, if you see the remittance, uh, Nepal officially receives around eight to nine billion dollars, and now it is increasing because a lot of people these days are going to Europe, Australia, and more skilled. So the remittance is increasing. Earlier, it used to be close to 100% cash, but after COVID, if you see the data, uh, it is around 25 to 30% in bank accounts, and in wallets also, it has become 0.5%. We are expecting it to grow to 2 to 3% in, 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 in days to come. So currently also in Khalti, you can send money, you can go to Remitly app and send to Khalti directly. Or you can go to World Remit, so it works in 70 countries, just go to send money to Nepal, send to Khalti and instantly you get it in Khalti. Similarly, cross-border payments, you know, global is the new national. So in coming days, you might see Paytm to Khalti, that can happen. But there are some challenges. So in India, uh, like, on the top it is UPI, but uh, uh, bottom there is NEFT, you know. So th I think there, ha which recognizes only bank. So on this side maybe SBI is working on it and uh, from the sending side also, it, if the consumer even sends from Paytm or anything, it has to come through a bank. Receiving payments would start initially. There are some challenges in terms of uh, the revenue share or the cost. And then sending is another challenge. Why sending is ch a challenge, like you might say that, okay, cards are already allowed, as in, like I can use a card from Nepal and go to India and swipe, like one lakh rupees. But allowing that, that for QR codes, you know, for QR code, I don't have to go to India, right? I can be here, I can scan the QR and the money would start going outside. And that's where the problem is because we are again forest deficit. So there are other policy level challenges. Uh, but yes, in coming days, you might see cross-border payments, uh, India to Nepal, with some limits, obviously. The good thing about Rashtra Bank is that now they have removed the limit to receive money in wallets. They, to you know, minimize this hundi, they have cancelled all domestic remittance. So now you can't do domestic remittance. You can, you can do only through wallets. So they have cancelled it. And to receive uh, money in wallets, they, they have removed the limit. So even you can receive 10 lakh rupees in Khalti uh, through Remitly or World Remit. So these are some good things happening. And last question uh, for cu uh, customer protection, Nora. Uh, it's a very good question. See, there's a long way to go. There are challenges, like I mentioned earlier. For example, we are a wallet. We are integrated to some PSO. And you know we are dependent on that PSO. And a lot of PSOs saw a big surge. And they were not ready. The technology was not ready. and they're I would not na name the PSO, but there has been the settlement challenges where customers were not, or even the merchants were not getting refund on time. But you no know, necessity is the mother of all inventions, so baby steps are being taken care of. As an institution, we are regulated by NRB, and uh, it's very tough. So like as a promoter, I am not in the operations of the company. I can't sign any checks. So we are treated like a 
public company. All the consumer money in the settlement account, which is non-operative, and it has to report every day, and we have to report separately, and the balance should match. So there are these regulations. We have mandate for PCI DSS. It's like payment card industry data security standards. Uh, ISO is the mandate, so we are ISO 27001. On all our websites, it's a mandate from NRB. If you go to Khalti's website or any website, you have a dedicated grievance handling person's dedicated mobile number. And there's a mandate of having 6 a.m. to 12 a.m. live uh, call centers. So in our capacity, we are trying best. And Khalti, for especially Khalti, we have that customer first values. And that has been uh, the main game changer for us, why customers are sticking to us. But having said that, like I mentioned earlier, there are cases where the refund is not in our control. We have to depend on third party and their support is not available. So these, because of these challenges, you know, now we are pressurizing that, okay, you have to keep automated system. You need to keep a person for dedicated support even in off time. And I think gradually uh, we are progressive. Thanks. Thank you. Dilip, any, any final questions, comments you have before I move on to the page? I don't think anything was directed to me, so. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> it's fine. Thank you. So, so I, I think I'm just mindful of the time. We are just going to add five more minutes. So. You know, uh, Dipesh will make his concluding remarks, and then we'll have the closing remarks. So three, three minutes. There were lots of questions come in, so I'm giving you some extra uh, Thank time you. One of the friends who is doing uh, economics, in, and he's in last year. I forget your name, sorry. You talk about the action plan for one-stop solution. The biggest challenge is to convince the policymakers for, to the idea. Now the policymakers are convinced to the idea, right? So they have included in the common minimum program about one-stop solution. Now we are, we are, see, we are trying to work with the development partners as well. We are onboarding them so that they have the expertise, they have presence worldwide. We, uh, yeah, the organization like World Bank will be appropriate for us to advise, to give the technical advice on this, how the one-step solutions can be, are successful in other countries and how that can be implemented in Nepal. But for, for first, we, we are going to start with the services that can be given in the one-stop solutions. See, before establishing one-stop solution, we have to change many laws. Because, see, if, till, uh, the present law does not allow us to collect the fingerprint of the people, of the citizens somewhere else for the passport. So it means that it is already in the law. It means that digital transformation is not only about the digital things. It's about the business process re-engineering re as well. So see, the biggest appetite of the people, what is the biggest appetite of the people in Nepal? The biggest appetite is governance. If they get, go get the good governance, I think they will be happy to the government. The government. So. Now we are in the phase of making the action plan. That was for this question. And uh, our friend from Himalayan Everest Insurance talk about reaching to the people. See, we have respected doctors, uh, Dr. Suresh Manandar he, uh, he here. I met him in the Prime Minister's office and he has a very good idea about how AI can be implemented in this digital transformation. We were thinking about the concept, about the e-governance blueprint, about integrating the services. And before we talk about our concept, he was saying about the concept, this should be implemented. So I was too much happy on that day because our ideas is validated by a person who has worked for more than 20 years in UK. So it means that we are going to onboard the experts like him. We are going to onboard the people like you. Because without onboarding all of the stakeholders in this mission, we are not going to succeed. Last week, uh, US, Nepal Ambition US uh, organized one program, and uh, World Bank, and I think World Bank organized that, World Bank and US, uh, Nepal Ambition US, and in that program also what I say is that, see, see the progress of India. I attended one program in Ethiopia. We were the attendees of that program. But most of the panelists of that program was, was from India. So it means that, see the level of the uh, Indian citizens, they have already reached in the global level. And they are bringing that their global expertise to their country. So it's like to 
uh, yeah, we are also thinking some of the some of the ideas on this, but we would like to give this assignment to the, our development partners. Please bring the global ideas, global successful stories, so that we can implement that, those things in Nepal as well. And the, I think I answered all the questions. And about the analog and digital things, see, until and unless we design the whole ecosystem, we will we'll, we'll be in line to fill up the form, see, we are, we are in the line, in the queue, in the online system as well. See, we if we talk about passport, you are in the queue, in the online system, right? So, first, so now talking about the, a, a piece, now talking about one component is not transforming our ecosystem. We should talk as a whole, and we should talk about the whole ecosystem not one piece. So if we talk about the whole ecosystem, then the problem you are talking about will be solved. And lastly, what I want, want to share is, let's imagine, us, let's imagine our country where we can do census in seven days, where we can count the number of cows a farmer has in his home in real time. If, see, this is already possible in the European countries. We take more than one year, two years, three years for the census. But for the coming census, we should make such an integrated system where the Central Bureau of Statistics is possible to, the census, to do census in real time. It means that we should integrate our system. Second, if we order some things from Daraz, or if we order Momo from Pudmandu, we'll get that service in our home and we'll pay money. People are paying for passport. People are paying for license, but they are not getting that in home. So we should shift our paradigm. And that paradigm is government should not only be treated as a regulator. Government should be treated. Government should, re, re, government should restructure its, itself as a service provider. So let's imagine the day where our NID, where our Nagarikta, where our passport will come to your home. So that is our imagination. So, so I would like to request all of you, let's be on board it to make, a, um, to make Nepal digital Nepal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is a great way to end this session. Thank you, panelists. I think a lot of issues being discussed you know, I, I'm always looking at the glass half full. I'm always looking, being optimistic. And then what we heard here, I think it, we get always clouded by all the negative news that goes around in the newspapers and social media. But we have seen tremendous progress of companies. You know, I mean, this is the companies like Khalti, Daraz, it's not just been there for ages. They're just companies that we have seen in the last decades, and they've done wonders. We've seen a lot of other uh, companies, you know, startups, and, and I think Nepal has done w wonderfully well. And now it's good to hear today from uh, the side of the government to say that government is looking at what it's doing as a service and having people like Dipesh out there and hopefully you know, you'll be able to push around, convince you know, all the people you need to convince and we are there to uh, you know, help and definitely the me big message is that the Digital Nepal framework for which we are doing this Digital Chautari series is that yes, we've been talking but we need some of those uh, implemented implementation instruments like the, the management offices and the, the, having the steering committees meet. I think this is a message we are going to take around. Thank you very much and, uh, for, for, for this wonderful discussion. Appreciate your time. And thank you, audience, for the question. And, and we, would, you know, we, can, uh, we can ask the panelists to leave the stage. And I would now request uh, for the closing remarks from uh, <laughs> Mr. Meen Prasad Aryal, Director, Standardization Division. Uh, Nepal Telecommunication Authority uh, for his uh, final remarks, and you have within five minutes. Five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Sujiji. We have wonderful session on this uh, NEF talk that is digital services, and we came to learn a lot of things. We came to know different uh, aspect from different distinguished experts, means our speakers. 
Uh, and since I am from Nepal Telecommunications Authority, I'd like to say a few words on behalf of uh, the telecom regulator, that is uh, the Nepal Telecommunications Authority. All we know that uh, the telecom or the ICT is a key enabler or the tool to carry out our activities easy and convenient. Uh, because we all use the telecom or ICT services during our daily lives, during our life. Uh, life. So it is, uh, as it, is, uh, taken, it, is it is being taken as an essential service, uh, as a fundamental uh, service to all of us. Uh, we, all we know that the uh, telecom penetration, that means in terms of uh, voice or in terms of data, it is being exponentially increased. Well, we know that if we go to the uh, few uh, decade history, the uh, penetration of internet is exponentially increased. Right now, it is almost 130% subscription that is in compared to our populations. And if we go to the uh, voice penetration, we have a mobile penetration of almost 123%. So far, we are also uh, working on the, for the development and expansion of telecommunication services through the licensing and regulations of telecommunication services as applicable. Uh, since we know that the uh, paradigm is uh, from uh, voice-centric applications to the data-centric applications is being increased, a lot, a lot of activities. And we know that the global, if we go through the, uh, our index, global cybersecurity index of Nepal, that is uh, uh, of 2020, it is 94th out of 182 countries. That means there is a gap still. If you go to the uh, e-governance index of Nepal, that is uh, published by the uh, UN in, in 2022, it is 125th position out of 193 countries. That means we, we see a lot of gap still there is. So there is a lot of uh, gap and challenges as well, and there is a lot of opportunity as well, because there is a gap. So you need to bridge the gap that we have for the development and expansion of the uh, ICT services and telecom services as well. Uh, as I think that there are major three pillars that we need to take into account. First thing is the resilient connectivity. That is, we need to take into account. The connectivity should be resilient. And the second part is the affordable. Because the service shall be affordable to all the concerned target people mass or the general people. And the third thing is the trust, that means the safety, that we call it right nowadays, cyber security, or uh, two other words. So these are the three major pillars that we need to take into account by the different associated uh, stakeholders. And uh, the government of Nepal and the Nepal Telecommunications Authority is working in different uh, institutional, uh, legal, or uh, policy arrangement as applicable. And we, we all know that, we already know that uh, we have a Digital Nepal framework that has envisaged eight different sectors and 80 different uh, initiatives. So it is necessary to accelerate, uh, to achieve the target that is identified by the Digital Nepal framework. Also we have in Nepal the policy target, that means in the telecom policy, in the broadband policy, uh, and in, in the ICT policy. It is necessary to achieve the target identified in the policy and the legal framework. And the Nepal Telecom Authority and the government of Nepal, the Ministry of uh, Communication and Information is working for the uh, development of new uh, target with a new revised integrated ICT policy. Uh, uh, and we are also facilitating for the expansion and uh, deployment of the new technologies Right now we have uh, expanded uh, 4G up to the rural areas and 5G is being on testing. So far in the near future we facilitate for the bringing or deployment of the new technologies uh, in Nepal. And there is a lot of challenges as you know that digital skills and the, uh, what we call it previously we heard that uh, the infrastructure sharing that means the uh, duplication of investment is there and uh, lack of skills literacy, so many things are there. So it is necessary to uh, uh, address such challenges and convert it into opportunities and make uh, 
the uh, Nepal as a digital Nepal and for the benefit of the people. That means uh, I, I would like to say that means uh, affordable uh, connectivity, that means the uh, broadband for all, it is necessary for, for all of us so that the different services from different uh, dimensions we can, be util we can use in the near future so that our uh, life will be uh, more uh, quality and it will be improved for the welfare of the uh, human being. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this uh, NEF talk uh, and um, uh, giving me this uh, opportunity and other distinguished ex uh, panelists and experts to participate in the program. And thank you very much for your valuable time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Min Prasad Aryal. Uh, so once again, a round of applause for our panelists, our speakers. Thank you. And, uh, these discussions are going to continue for those who are interested to know what's happening with Nepal Economic Forum to do follow us on social media uh, platforms on LinkedIn, Twitter. You'll find these videos are going to be uploaded on YouTube channel and you can share. Uh, on FPOT 53, an agriculture specialist uh, special has just been launched. You can download it for free. Tomorrow we are launching the financial inclusion report with UNCDF, uh, UN Capital Development Fund and International Finance Corporation. Uh, this would be uh, a closed-door event tomorrow. And on the 8th of May, the World Bank Development Report has just been launched yesterday, so there's a discussion uh, and uh, on the report and the Nepal launch on the 8th of May, so look out and you can register for that event. And IMF is approving uh, the Nepal credit on May 1st, so you'd be seeing some of our... Um, there would be a webinar and... A, a publication coming out this week on the approval. I think we are all set. Uh, hopefully the board is not going to disapprove the loan. And do sign in for our weekly updates. And thank you so much for being here and please join us for Haiti. And thank you team for the great work of putting this together. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>